yesterday we discussed there is Shreya happiness and there is Preya happiness. There is one kind of happiness which is hedonic, which is pleasing in the present, it is delightful to the senses, but in the long run it amounts to nothing. Because when that enjoyment is finished, the happiness also goes away, so you make another desire and then again it goes away. There's another kind of happiness that comes from within. That is the eudaimonic bliss. It is the bliss you get when you feel good about yourself. And that comes by trying to be the best version of yourself and trying to do the best that you can do. Hence, the formula we concluded with yesterday was that you be good and you do good, then you will feel good. But in the science of happiness, we need to come up with more tools how to handle adversity. Because adversity is a reality of life, even though we would like to eradicate it. Let us say that you have a child and you call a Jochi astrologer to make the Jan Kundli, the birth chart. And the astrologer gives a prediction. Till the age of seven, your child will suffer from bad health. But then he will become alright. And at twelve, he will win the spelling bee. But at fifteen, he will have a car crash. But at 18, he will enter an Ivy League college. And then at 22, he will marry somebody from another culture. And at 25, he will launch a startup. At 27, he will go bankrupt. But at 33, he will become the CTO of a multinational corporation. <laughs> it's going ding dong, ding dong. Now, if you had a choice, you would remove all the negatives. I don't want my child to have any negatives. But the fact of life is, the negatives are always there. It's a dichotomous world. The day is followed by the night. The summer is followed by the winter. And moments of joy are followed by moments of challenge and distress. So how to remain happy in the face of adversity is what we want to discuss. When we conclude today, we must have some clear wisdom about it. First thing to keep in mind is that these adversities are just single nodal points in life. They come and they go. But when we make a big deal out of them, oh my God, I failed, and we keep remembering them, that is when they put us down. Then we go with a label on our head, I failed, and it doesn't help at all. In Stanford, a research was done on graduates from their business school. Those who failed early in their professional career, how did they do in future? And it was discovered that if they maintained a positive mindset to that failure, they learned so much from it that they outshone the others who did not have the experience of failure. So that failure turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Now, these people who you find have been exceptional luminaries in the world also encountered failure, but they continued and went beyond it. Take the example of the most popular Indian president since independence, Abdul Kalam. He was born in the holy town of Dhanush Kodi, in the Mohammedan family, his father owned a ferry ship, he used to ferry passengers. And Abdul Kalam was the third of five siblings. 
So he was in a very ordinary school and not an exceptional student. But he was hard working. And he used to sell, distribute newspapers to augment his family income. And in the morning at 3 a.m. somebody would give free math tuitions which he would go and attend. So finally when he completed school, he managed to get a scholarship in physics. And he became a physics graduate but then realized that he did not like physics. But he then decided to go for aeronautical engineering and he got a scholarship in the Madras Engineering College. And there, his, he was struggling along as an aeronautical engineer and his project which he submitted got rejected by the professor who said that you need to correct it in 72 hours or I will cancel your scholarship. The next 72 hours he, he did not eat or sleep and finally when he made a submission it was accepted. After completing his engineering, in those days, in 1950, there were only two options for aeronautical engineers in India. One was the DRDO, Defense Research and Development Organization, and one was the Indian Air Force. He went for the Indian Air Force interview, and out of 28 candidates, 8 were selected. He was the ninth. He was rejected. Crestfallen, he went to Rishikesh and met Swami Shivananda of the Divine Life Society. Swami Shivananda said that, look, failure is not a bad thing at all. The Bhagavad Gita begins from a state of lamentation. Hence, the first chapter of the Gita is Arjun Vishad Yog. Arjun was morose. And that created in him the quest for knowledge. And it is how the Bhagavad Gita came about. So be positive and read the Gita every day. Abdul Kalam kept up that habit. He joined the DRDO and the United States invited five scientists from India and he was one of them. They liked his work ethics and his competence and offered him a permanent job at NASA which he rejected to go and serve his country. When he returned, he talks, he was deputed to ISRO, Indian Satellite Research Organization. And he says in those days, we had practically no infrastructure. We used to carry rocket parts and bullet carts. And in 1963, he was made the director of the satellite launch vehicle project. So in 1969 and in 1979 when they launched their first satellite it was a failure. So Abdul Kalam was completely dejected. How will I face the media? The chairman of ISRO, Dr. Satish Dhawan, he took the stage and he said, Dr. Kalam and his team are competent. They will succeed in the space of one year. And that turned out to be true the very next year. In 1980, India launched SLV-3 and it reached the elite group of nations with the capacity to launch satellites. And again, Dr. Satish Dhawan gave the entire credit to Dr. Kalam's team. Dr. Kalam later said, I have learned how to succeed from many, but I learned how to handle failure from my chairman. And then, in those days, there was a lot of deliverance from India's neighbors, and there was need now to enhance the missile power so he was taken back into DRDO and he was put in the, as the head of the Bizai project. He is that's why called the Bizai man of India. Under his leadership, India launched first the Trishul, then the Prithvi, then the Akash. 
And finally, when they wanted long-range missiles, the Agni was repeatedly failing. It again became a national joke. And Amul chipped in, you know, their humorous cartoons. They came up with a cartoon, if they are falling short of fuel, let them try and use Amul butter as their fuel. But in 1985, they succeeded with the Agni, and India reached the top six nations with such power. And then again, the nuclear threat increased because of the neighbors. And again, Dr. Kalam was put in charge of Operation Shakti in 1993. 1997, they detonated the nuclear devices. And 22 days after that, Pakistan also detonated a device. The reveal they had been secretly working on nuclear technology. 1998, he became, he was, he received the Bharat Ratna, the highest Indian civil award. Well, look what a checkered career he had. Now, here's an interesting example from the American scenario. This gentleman, at the age of 23, he launched a startup which failed. And at 24, he again launched a startup which failed and he went bankrupt. And at 26, his beloved died. As a result of which, in 27, he went into depression. But nevertheless, he married. And at 33, two of his children died in an accident. At 34, he stood, stood for the House of Congress but lost. And at 36, he again stood for the House of Congress and lost. And at 45, he stood for senatorship and lost. And at 47, he stood for vice president and lost. And at 47, again, he stood for senatorship and lost. But at 52, he became the 16th president of the USA. You know who I'm talking about? Abraham Lincoln. His checkered life has captured the fancy of so many people that 18,000 books have been written about him. So the point is that failure is just one node in the journey of life. We should not take it as a final declaration. But what we need to learn here is how did these people handle failure and still remain positive? What makes us unhappy is the negativity bias of our mind. Our mind has a tendency to focus on the deficiencies and the lacks. There may be 10 areas of your life that are going perfectly and one area that is going wrong. But the mind keeps thinking about that. That's the problem. Like, for example, have you ever had mango fibers stuck in your mouth? Or soft fennel seed? And what happens? The tongue keeps on revisiting that place. <laughs> there are 27 crevices in the mouth, which are absolutely okay, but the tongue is not concerned. It's concerned about this one place, which is a problem area. <laughs> Likewise, you, did 50 things right and made one mistake. And that one mistake makes you feel so bad some people even go into depression. Your boss gave you 10 praises and one critical feedback. The mind keeps on rotating that. Why did he write this about me? This is the negativity bias of our human brain. It is the way the brain has been designed. And do you know why it's been designed like that? Now consider a fish in the ocean. It's got positive stimuli. It's got positive stimuli, food, nutrients that it can eat. 
and it's also got negative stimuli. The fish that the, the predator that can come and eat this fish. So, this little fish in the ocean, if it misses the nutrition, that is not life threatening because there will be more opportunities. But if it misses the predator, it is the end of the story because it will lose its life. That is why God has organized the physiology of the fish's brain to prime it towards negative stimuli. And unfortunately our human brain is also hardwired towards negative stimuli. So those negative stimuli affect you more deeply and you remember it much longer. Only thing is that for human beings, the negatives in the environment are not life threatening. It could just be an emotional distress, a social uncertainty, and just thinking about it over and over doesn't help solve the problem. In fact, it increases the problem. But the negativity bias of the brain comes into the way. Scientists have done research, the Gallup organization did a survey of 17 different countries. They were studying that why does the media keep on churning out negative news? 190 countries are not at war and the media is not concerned that these countries are getting along well together. Two countries are at war and they just keep on talking about that. There are a million places where no fire is burning but it doesn't make news. And one place where there is a fire makes news. You know, when I was doing business studies many, many years ago, they told us, look, if a dog bites a man, that is no news. If a man bites a dog, that is news. <laughs> So the media has got this negativity bias. They did a survey of 17 countries and discovered that any time you read a positive news, it doesn't register deeply. You read it, oh, okay, okay. And when you read a negative news, it just rivets your attention. Oh, and you continue to remember it. So the media is interested in its TRP points. Naturally, they want to maximize that. It gets maximized through negative news, so they keep on telling you all the bad things that are happening. But this also is important in relationships. See, because to your spouse, you said five good things, the spouse will forget. And then one nasty remark, the spouse will remember. As somebody said that my spouse is historical, Historical, no, no, historical. <laughs> Remembers all the things that were said 50 years ago. Hence, marriage counselors have discovered this golden rule that in any relationship for it to go well, the positive uh, interactions versus the negative interactions must have a ratio of 5 is to 1. Because the one negative will be equal to five positive. <laughs> and that is why also for bosses, the rule is given in organizations. That if you have to give an adverse feedback to your subordinate, you must sandwich it. First say two positive things, then one negative, then again two positive. It will be digested. And if you just give the negative, this person will, oh, my boss is always telling me bad things. So this negativity bias of our mind is making us unhappy. That is the problem. Because we are focused on all the lack, on the bad things people are doing to us, the bad thing we may have done, or the adversity that may have come our way, and we are forgetting all the blessings. And this situation is getting compounded by a thing 
called the Tetris effect. So what is the Tetris effect now? See, if you repeat a thought pattern, if you repeat an emotion again and again and again, the neurons that are responsible for making you experience that emotion, the neurons that get fired in your brain, they start getting hardwired together. Your brain has a neuroplastic nature. The brain is self-teaching. When it realizes that this activity is getting repeated, the brain then creates shortcuts to enable to facilitate that activity to be done more easily next time. That is the habit forming nature, right? Like first time when you started typing, how much of labor it took you mentally to type the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. But later on, when you became habituated, you could type 60 words in a minute. How did this happen? The brain formed neural pathways to facilitate it. Likewise, when we keep on thinking negative, 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 the brain hardwires for it to complicate the problem. So the Tetris effect, Tetris was a video game that was invented actually in 1980. And what does it involve? That from the top, from the skyline, objects, geometrical objects fall of different shapes and different sizes. And the player has to rotate the instrument to ensure it falls perfectly in the gap to create a complete horizontal line and moment the line is complete it disappears. So like any video game, it's extremely addictive. And in the year 2002, one Britisher called Faiz Choktat he had gone on his honeymoon to Egypt with his wife and while returning he was arrested on the flight because they kept on saying switch off the electronics and he refused to switch off. He had gotten so addicted. So later on in Britain the judge gave him four months imprisonment. He said you threatened all the passengers on the flight. So this was the one instance of somebody being in prison for playing video games. But he realized the addiction it caused. Later on, Harvard psychologists, they did a study on this. They paid the students to play video games, Tetris for eight hours, for three days at a stretch. Now, apparently, it is any student's dream job. You play video games and play and get paid for it as well. But the students later on realized it had created cognitive dissonance. Like, for example, if you look at a flame for 15 minutes and then close your eyes, you will still see the colors of the flame despite closing the eyes. It's called cognitive dissonance. <clears throat> so they had played Tetris for 8 hours, 8 hours, 8 hours. And later on the students confessed that their mind was stuck. When they would see the skyline, they would think, you know, this building could fall like this, it could fit into that gap. And while walking, in Walmart, they would think if the Cheerio box could turn like this, it would really fit into that gap. And uh, one of them, he said, uh, when I was walking along the wall, it had the smaller dark tiles below and the bigger tiles above, lighter ones, and I was keeping on trying to turn them in my mind. So this Tetris effect was because the brain had started changing its neural structures. Now look at its application in real life. One gentleman psychologist called Sean Acker, he was invited by KPMG to try and figure out why 
their accountants were so unhappy. So KPMG is one of the top five accounting firms of the world. Like the uh, Price Water Cooper, Deloitte, etc. Now their problem was that these accountants were highly qualified and they had gotten one of the best jobs in the world. So why were they so unhappy? And Sean Acker, he discovered that all day long they were searching for defects in those balance sheets, in the accounts. So they had gotten stuck in the Tetris effect. They could not separate that negativity bias from their personal life. And when they would go home and their spouse cooked something, they could see the thing that was overcooked and they could not see all the good things that had been cooked. And when the child got the great card, they could only see the C grade, but they were missing out on the A grades. And one of the accountants confessed sheepishly that he had made an excel sheet of his wife's defects and he made it to her. <laughs> and she was soon to become his ex-wife. <laughs> So, this working on negativity in the office created such a brain structure that bled into their personal life, their relational life as well. And this is also obvious in the case of advocates. You may be shocked to hear that advocates are 3.6 times more prone to depression than the general populace. That is astonishing. It means the chance of an advocate getting depression is 360% that of an average person. Now why should that be so? Advocates in the US, their salaries are above the median salary of the population. They are well qualified. They have dignified jobs? Well, the seed got planted in law school itself where they were trained in critical thinking, keep on looking for defects, keep on a suspicious mindset and that is how the Tetris effect worked on them. It then continues in their personal life and doesn't leave them. So what I need to say is, first of all, the negativity bias of the brain, which is getting compounded because of the Tetris effect, which is the result, the reason why so many people are unhappy. But it does not have to be like this. Any situation can be seen through various perspectives. When we look at something negatively, we assume that this is the only way we can see the situation. And we forget there is a positive perspective to the same situation. Once a nurse at an army hospital was relating, two soldiers had come wounded from the war. They had been brought there. Both of the soldiers had identical injuries. One of their legs had been blown off in a grenade explosion. And this nurse was relating the completely contrasting perspectives of these soldiers. One was cursing his luck. He was cursing the war. He was extremely annoyed with his commander for having put him on the front line. With his comrades for not supporting him. And he had a complete list of complaints which was making him so bitter. And in the same situation was the other soldier who was full of gratitude and saying, you know what? I went through such a situation and I still live to tell the tale. It's alright, technology will enable me to get an artificial limb, but I could have lost my life. God is so kind. 
I must have done some very bad karmas that got cut in a little bit. I must thank my stars for being alive today. Two soldiers in the same situation were holding such different perspectives. And what does it mean? It means that any situation can be viewed in different ways. When we are unhappy, we presume that our unhappiness is justified by the situation without realizing that a change in perspective can make us happy as well. As the story goes, once one lady came to me, she was known as the unhappy lady. So she always was unhappy. And I asked her, Deviji, what is the reason for your miseries? She said, Swamiji, you will not believe. I don't have one happy day because I have two daughters and I got both married. One I married to a printmaker, one I married to an umbrella seller. Now, whenever there is rain, that brickmaker daughter, she cries to me, Mummy, how will we make bricks this raining today? Please pray to God that there should be no rain and we make lots of bricks. But whenever there is sunshine, then my umbrella selling daughter cries to me, Mummy, how will we sell umbrellas today? There is no rain. Please pray to God that there should be rain. So either there is rain or there is sunshine. Now, whenever there is rain, I think of my big selling daughter and I am unhappy. And whenever there is sunshine, I think of my umbrella selling daughter and I am unhappy. So I am always miserable. I said, Makati, if I can make a little recommendation, all you need to do is a little switch. Whenever there is rain, you think of the umbrella selling card, not of the brick making card. And whenever there is sunshine, you think of the brick making card. After that, she always became happy. Because either there is rain or there is sunshine. She just changed her perspective. And because she was always happy, she got now the title of the happy lady. From the unhappy lady, she became the happy lady just by changing her perspective. So, the Vedas inform us that look, dear souls, you think you are seeing, you are trusting your vision, you are trusting your perspective, but from the divine perspective you are blind. You don't know how to see. Hence the scriptures are called Darshan Shastra that enable you to truly see. So why are they called Darshan Shastra? See in America there was once a TV serial that was very popular called the Three Stooges. Where it would have these three clouds. And one of them would start screaming, I cannot see, I cannot see, I cannot see. And the second clown would say, why can you not see? He would say, because my eyes are closed. <laughs> so the second clown would pop him on the head, he would open his eyes and say, now I can see. <laughs> the scriptures likewise are saying that you cannot really see because your perspective has gotten warped. In your value system, you have made comfort the number one priority. How do I become comfortable? And from the grand design of the universe, your growth is the number one priority. Now to grow, sometimes adversity becomes the catalyst. Because adversity challenges you. It forces you to exert yourself beyond your comfort zone. It forces you to use your spiritual wisdom. And that is when growth happens. Growth requires going beyond the comfort zone. If you don't do that, you can never grow. One child, he was in fifth grade. And 
school, his general science class, he learned about how the caterpillar leaves a cocoon and then goes into hibernation for a few weeks and finally emerges as a beautiful butterfly. So this child coming back from school on his garden lot in front of his house on a rose bush, he saw a cocoon hanging. He was thrilled. Wow! This will be my personal science laboratory. I will see the miracle of nature, the butterfly emerge. Every day while going to school, while returning, he would check. And one day, sure enough, the tear was very visible. Since it was a Saturday morning, after every hour he was coming to check. And by midday, the butterfly was emerging. It was tearing apart its home to come into this beautiful world. But he was looking transfixed now. And halfway through, the butterfly seemed to get stuck. It just could not dislodge itself. And the cocoon was bobbing up and down. He thought the butterfly is in great pain. So pain we always think is a bad thing. There should be no pain. And finding the butterfly in pain, he said, let me do my good deed for the day. He ran home, got a pair of scissors and clipped the cocoon open. He thought the butterfly will fly away, but it dropped to the ground. He saw it was squirming around in circles. And look carefully to discover that its stomach was swollen and the wings shriveled. So he thought maybe the wings will fill up and the stomach will shrink. But little did he know that this would now never happen. The struggle was an essential part of the evolution of the butterfly. Without the struggle, because the struggle would have pushed the fluid from the stomach into the wings. Without the opportunity to handle that adverse situation, the butterfly would remain ever crippled. Likewise, when God puts challenges in our way, we immediately conclude this is a bad thing. And we look for somebody who will come with the scissors and clip it all away. Little do we know it's part of God's grand design to fill our spiritual wings for the spiritual flight ahead. He wants us to grow in the face of difficulties. The Swami Vivekanand put it very well when he said that life is the continual unfoldment of a being under circumstances tending to press it downwards. The way God has designed this universe is, it is the university of hard knocks. The life will always press you downwards. You will bear with those challenges and grow in the process. Now tell me, is any of you facing problems in your life? Everyone is. I should reframe you. Is anybody not facing problems? That is how this world is. So rather than saying, hey, kya ho gaya? why is this happening, etc. Just change your perspective. As somebody said, I prayed to God for wisdom. He gave me problems to solve that I may become wise. I prayed to God for strength. He gave me obstacles to overcome that I may grow in strength. I prayed to God for courage. He gave me dangers to surmount that I may become courageous. I prayed to God for love. He gave me the poor and downtrodden to serve that I may develop love. 
My prayers were answered not by getting what I asked, but by receiving what I needed. So what we need to do then is to have faith in God and in His grand design. Just like you see in nature, the mud transforms into grass. Grass which grows is transformed mud. And that grass is grazed by the cow. And the cow, in its udder, creates milk, which is extracted and then transformed into yogurt, which is churned to extract butter, which is then heated to create ghee. And the ghee gets offered on the altar of God. So the ghee that you are offering on the altar is actually mud that has been evolved. Now if you want to see in a longer time frame, the diamonds that you are bearing are actually also transformed mud, carbon in the crust of the earth. Pressure was applied on the coal and the carbon structures changed over millions of years to create fancy diamonds. So you see this evolution happening in nature, but this is not the primary purpose of God's creation. The primary purpose of God's creation is to evolve souls like you and I over a continuum of lifetimes to the ultimate perfection. So you need to have faith that God's design is perfect and even austerities, difficulties are a part of the grand scheme of things. Again Swami Vivekananda said that these great prophets whom you and I worship were not human. <coughs> they were human as you and I. And they had attained super consciousness. And you and I can do the same. The very fact that one person attained that state indicates that all can do so. And that ultimately is religion. What is religion? It's the science of it growing your soul to this ultimate supreme <coughs> perfection. That is why even the Bible says, be ye pure even as your Father in heaven is pure. That is the ultimate goal. So when we are faced with difficulties, what we need to do is to change our perspective. When you positively reframe a situation, all your miseries will disappear. One little girl was doing her homework and the mother peeped over the shoulder, my child, what are you writing? She said, I'm writing negative gratitude. The mother said, what is that? My teacher has given homework, write gratitude for negative things in your life. So the mother said, what have you written? The little child had written, I am thankful for the bitter medicine because it means I will become alright, my sickness will go away. I am thankful for having to study hard for the final exam because it means after that I will have a vacation. So the mother said, wow, this is a very useful tool. I can use that as well. And she went and started writing for herself. I am thankful for the taxes I have to pay because it means I have an income. Otherwise I would not pay taxes. I am thankful for having to clean up my house because it means I have a home to live in. I am thankful for cleaning the mess after the party with the friends because it means I have a circle of friends. And the list goes on. So, no matter what the adversity, try and find a silver lining. I was just saying today to some people, the one gentleman, newly married husband and wife, the husband was so attached to his big car. 
And when he came home, he told his wife, Today is the best day in my life. The wife said what? He said, you know, my BMW has got smashed. Correct? I knew how attached you are to your BMW. How come you are thanking God? He said, you know, I've gotten away with a little scratch on my little finger. BMW is smashed, so what? Then we get replaced, the insurance will take care, a little gap, we fill it up ourselves. But I have been saved. Now imagine, in that accident, he is realizing the silver lining. But this is the positive reframing, which the art you can learn, you will always find ways to look at situations and be happy. Our Vedas tell us, this whole world is the veritable form of God. Purusha Sutta says everywhere is God. Vasudeva Sarvamiti, the Bhagavad Gita says, and the Ramayana says, Siya Ramamaya Sabajagajani. No Sita Ram to be everywhere. So we say God is Ghat Ghat Vasi. What do you mean by Ghat Ghat Vasi? Everywhere is God, which means the world is divine. Now you change the way that you are going to look at this world. That is positive reframing. After this, I am going to explain to you the physiology of happiness. How our brain perceives happiness. Let us now get into the physiology of happiness. How does our brain cooperate in our experience of this emotion of happiness. Recent, shh, no talking please. Recent progress in neurological sciences has been the result of modern gadgets that have been developed, like the fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, the QEEG, quantitative electroencephalography machine, the PET machine, positrons, emissions, tomography machine. And the scientists still see this as a black box, but they have a slight inkling of what's going on. So they have discovered four chemicals that give the experience of happiness. And these are called the dose chemicals. D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. So let us study them in a sequence to give you an idea. Let us first take endorphins. Endorphins are chemicals released in the brain when you exercise. So exercise causes pain and discomfort and the endorphins mask that pain thereby enabling you to keep on exercising. Endorphin basically means internally produced morphine. The morphine is the painkiller to mask pain. Now your brain is masking pain through endorphins and exercising is one way to generate it. And that is why people who do running every day, they experience the runner's high. What is this runner's high? The euphoria they got because of the endorphin production in the brain. And also they experience withdrawal symptoms, much like the drunkards do. One day they can't get their hit or their kick, etc. They experience withdrawal symptoms and so do the exercisers. When they can't do it, they feel some discomfort because that day they are missing on the endorphin thrill. But interestingly, these endorphins can also be created through laughter. So when you laugh, you immediately feel good. Why is that so? Because the brain secretes these endorphins. Now, in Sanskrit literature, there are six kinds of laughter. 
One is when, when you are laughing inside, but your lips are closed. The second is Upahasit, where the lips are open, but nobody can hear you. And the third is Hasit, where you laugh normally. The fourth is Ati Hasit, where you laugh loudly. People come and ask, what happened? And the fifth is Attahas, where you laugh so loud you have to catch your stomach. You know, once in a while it happens. No doubting, please. Now, the next one is Ujja Attahas, where you laugh so loud that the window panes start shaking. Bad kind of laughter. People do it in the villages where they don't have any pretense, just naturality, so they burst into laughter. My Gurudev, Kripaluti Maharaj was well known for that kind of laughter, Ucha Attahas. But the point to note is that the brain doesn't care whether you are making it or faking it. Whether you are laughing internally or just externally, it secretes the endorphins. Let's give it a try. Alright? So we will lift our arms and laugh the Ucha Attahas and then you see and you automatically feel happy in person. Let's give it a try. <laughs> Help. The second chemical is oxytocin. This is the social bonding chemical. When you have social proximity with others, you feel good about it. With your friends, relatives, your children, parents, siblings, spouse, etc. Just being close, the brain secretes this chemical. When the mother is with her child, there is so much of oxytocin which is creating all the love. Now this oxytocin is the reason why dogs love their master so much. See the cats don't. You are mistaken that the cat loves you. The cat loves the place more than the master. If the master goes and the cat is given a choice, it says, I'd rather choose this place. But the dog, any day it could be the master, who cares about the place? So now neurologists have studied the dog's brain that in the presence of the master, there is just so much of a spurt of oxytocin in the dog's brain, giving such happiness that the dog can't but avoid falling in love with the master. So, in us human beings also, this is the social bonding chemical. Now the third one, this is the deceptive chemical which is recently getting popular in discussion, dopamine. So what is dopamine? It gives you an expectation of happiness. Ah, if this desire gets fulfilled, there will be so much of joy. It is accompanied by the pain of the desire. Oh my God, if I don't get this, then I'm so discomfortable because of the desire. So it is accompanied by the pain of the desire and finally, it, there is no fulfillment. There is only a removal of the anticipation. So this chemical dopamine deludes the whole world. Everybody is making bad choices in regard to happiness because of the confusion that dopamine is causing. It's giving us the hope that sensual delights will truly fulfill. 
But the problem is that fulfillment is temporary and then to get the happiness again you create another desire. And the second time the happiness is less so you have to create a bigger desire. Which means that these sensual delights only keep on inflaming the desire. Hence the Bhagavatam says, Na jatu kama kama na upabhoge na shamyati havisha krishna vartame va bhuya eva dhivartate. The mo is like you have fire burning. And you say, okay, let me douse it by pouring ghee on it. For a moment it seems to have gone down, but then it flares up with redoubled intensity. The same is with your sensual delights. Dopamine tells you there is happiness there and you keep on running and running and running and there is never any fulfillment. The whole of life passes by in the Bhagavad The way that the Bhagavatam relates the story of Saubhari Mushi Muni. Saubhari Muni was a very accomplished sage. He would immerse himself in the river Yamuna and sit in Jal Samadhi. And there is a Saubhari Sutra in the Rig Ved. That is his accomplishment. You know, every mantra in the Vedas has got a Rishi. So there is a Saubhari Sutra. And he's also written a sacred book called Saubhari Samhita. But Saubhari Muni one day, he found two fish mating in the river and the dopamine deluded him to think ah if i create this desire there will be happiness so he left his samadhi the stories in the bhagavatam and he said i need to get married whom to marry the king of ayodhya was mandhaka he went to mandhaka's palace and said o oh, king Give me your daughter's hand in marriage. The king had 50 daughters and he got his head. Oh my God, this old emaciated sage, I have to give my princess to him. Her life will be ruined. So Mandata played a trick. He said, oh sage, we cannot dishonor your word. I will bring all the 50 daughters in front, whoever selects you, you marry him. He knew that none will select him. But the sage understood the trick and he counted it with another trick. He said, okay, that is how it will be, but not today, tomorrow. And in one day, by his yoga bal, he made himself extremely handsome, even more handsome than Kamdev, the Cupid himself. So when he came there and the daughters were brought, all of them selected him. <laughs> the poor king was bound by his words. Now he was in a fix. He married off his 50 daughters to Savari Muni and was wondering how will the sage take care of them. But the sage had such austerities that the bulk of it that he created 50 palaces and then expanded himself 50 times to stay with all his 50 wives. Now the story doesn't stop there. The Bhagavatam says, Tasu Patnyan, Janaya, Dhatma, Tulyani, Sarvasha, Ekai, Kasyam, Dasha, Dasha, Prakrite, Vilgu, Bhushaya. All the 50 queens, they had 10, 10 children each. And all those 10 children and further 10, 10 children. So a full little Minneapolis country. <laughs> Thousands of years went by. And one day the sage had a realization. He said, my God, where was I? I used to sit in the Yamuna and be in Samadhi. And this dopamine fooled me that just this one desire, if I fulfill, I will be happy. And I started off on this wild goose chase. After thousands of years, there is no fulfillment. So he said, Oh, Imam Pasham, Me Vinasham, Oh, human beings, look at my ruin. What ability do you have for bhog? I tried it with yoga bal. 
but the chemical that caused it is dopamine. So slowly the world is waking up to this deluded chemical that promises but never delivers. <laughs> so you know it is like that one man went to a curio shop, antiques and curio shop, and there were labels on everything. One was two dollars, one was five dollars, fifteen, twenty dollars, and one pad had a label ten thousand dollars. So he asked the shopkeeper that this is ten thousand dollars, everything is below twenty. What's so special? The shopkeeper said, Sir, it's a magic pad. Whatever you ask, it will fulfill. <laughs> really? Then it's worth its price. So he invested ten thousand dollars, purchased it, went home, put it in on his in his puja room up there. And then he said, Oh magic bank, you are God's blessing on me. Now give me one million dollars. And the magic bank started speaking. He said, Why one million dollars? Why not two million dollars? A very smart magic pad. <laughs> okay, magic pad, give me two million dollars. And magic pad said, Why two million? Why don't you ask for four million? He said, You know, that is also a point. So he said, Then give me four million dollars. Magic pad said, Why four million? Why not eight million? He said, What is going on out here? Whatever I say, it doubles. Give me eight million. Why don't you ask for sixteen million? So he took the magic pad and threw away that it's never fulfilling, it is only doubling what I'm saying. <laughs> this is the dopamine, the more you can free yourself from its entanglements, the more you can be free of addictions, the more you can grow in self-discipline, in willpower and control everything about your life. Now the fourth chemical is serotonin. Serotonin is generated when you feel good about yourself. It doesn't need anything from the outside. I remember Sindhutai Sabkal yesterday, poor lady. You may be poor, you may have nothing, but if you feel good about yourself, it secretes serotonin. So to get the benefit of that chemical, you go back and again to what I was saying yesterday. You try and be the best version of yourself. And it doesn't even matter how good you are. The delta is the important thing. Am I trying my best to improve? If you are, you will feel good about yourself. And this chemical will get secreted. So, then you try and be your best, try and do your best. And the serotonin kicks in to give you food. But this is our today's discussion on happiness. I hope that helps. Tomorrow we will talk about happiness in relationships. Day after tomorrow we will talk of happiness at the workplace. And I hope at the end of four days you will be much happier people. Sri Radha Krishna Bhagwan Ki yeah.